We're just waiting for everybody that's out in the foyer. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Welcome. Do you know how much God loves you? I hope you do, because it is beyond anything we could possibly imagine. We're going to look today and, you know, that God's love is greater than your sin. God's love is greater than anything you will go through in this life. It's greater than your past. It's greater than your present. It's greater than your future. I think sometimes as Christians, we walk through life and we forget how much God loves us. All right. That's my sermon for today. <laughs> Amen. But Amen. Would you like to stand with me and, and we'll worship the Lord in, in song. So, Father, we uh, just come before you, Lord, because we are just desiring to to just give our life before you Lord to worship you to honor you and so Lord may your spirit fall upon this house Lord may it fall upon our hearts leading and guiding us Lord Lord help us to be the Christians you desire us to be Lord help us to walk in the spirit and in truth Lord in Jesus name we pray amen <laughs> When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Yours will be the only name that matters to me The only one is favor I see name church the name of Jesus 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 just the name we glorify Jesus we worship you Yeah. 
Amen. 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 This weekend, hear it growing louder. Songs from every nation rising to your throne. And say. Every generation singing for your glory, telling what you've done. And from the north and south, we are crying out, there is hope.
Church, I'd like to invite our elder up to pray over our tithes and offerings this morning. Morning, Norm. I guess it would help. So Psalms 107, 8, Psalmist says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of man. Father God, thank you for reminding us constantly to pray. No matter how eloquent or not that we pray, no matter how simple our prayers, Jesus be with us. We know you hear our prayers because they come from our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, you are mercy. Jesus, you are justice. Jesus, you are worthy. That is what you are. Died alone to save me. Grow so you could raise me. Did this all to make me a chosen child of God. Worthy is the Lamb that was for slain to receive all glory, power, and praise. For with your blood you purchased us for God. Jesus, you are worthy. That is.
Justice and mercy, justice and mercy, justice and mercy, meet on the cross. Justice and mercy, justice and mercy, justice and mercy, Am I on? Okay, sorry. They purchased a campground up in, uh, by Duchesne. It's in the middle of nowhere. Strawberry Reservoir. Strawberry Reservoir, yeah. It's, it's way up there. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, it had flooded out, and, and so they got it for pennies on the dollar. And they've done a lot of work up there, and, and their desire is to make it a, a eventually a a Christian-based RV campground resort getaway place. The cool thing about it is, is there's opportunities there. So right now they're like, does anybody want to go and be a campground host? At the front, my wife says, we're going. <laughs> they're just looking for opportunities for people. You can go up there and stay for a month or a couple weeks or whatever and just kind of host the campground. They'll give you an RV spot there and, and just, I think it's awesome. If I could, I would. But uh, So if, you, if you're interested in that, maybe you're a, an RVer and you want a place to go for the summer, it's beautiful. It's in this slot canyon that is just, it's magnificent. And what's, what's really cool about it is that the sun follows the canyon. It isn't like some of those where the sun comes up and then it's gone. <laughs> And you're in this little shadow. No, it's just beautiful. And so uh, if you're interested, contact uh, Pastor Rick Nehrud there at Rick at Calvary SG, and he will get you plugged in. And also, we have our prayer slips here. If you would like us to pray for you, if you have a prayer need for yourself or for somebody else, please fill this out. Put it in the agape boxes there, or, and, and we would love to pray for you. And so please do that. All right, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. So if you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And so let us pray. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, praying that you would just lead us by your Spirit, God. Um, you have given us a spirit that dwells within our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, manifest yourself today. Lead us, guide us, Lord, in, into your will for our lives, uh, for your church, for your body. God, that we might just truly glorify you in all that we do and say that everything might be done according to your spirit, Lord. Thank you for your word. We ask that you would bless it today, Lord, for your sake, for your glory. Amen. So, we had finished up through verses 17 last week, and, and, and Paul had finished with this statement. He says, uh, it, And if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. And, and Paul had talked about this, this indwelling of the Spirit of God within us, right? It says, When we're born again, we're born by the Spirit of God. 
And when we're, we're, we're born again, we're given new life, the Spirit of God comes and takes up residence within you. Do you believe that? Really? You think you got this little spirit living inside you, the midst of your heart? It says not only was it the Spirit of God, but it's the Spirit of Christ. It's the same Spirit, right? And yes, He does. He lives in your heart. But more than that, does that mean that you're always doing what the Spirit of God desires you to do? No, not necessarily. You see, because He says, for as many as are led by the Spirit. You see, if we live according to the Spirit of God, then we will be led by the Spirit of God. We won't fight it. We'll allow it to take power over our lives, over our decision-making processes, and we will be led by the Spirit of God. And we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh, but we'll fulfill the desires of the Spirit. And he says, because these are the sons of God, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. I hate to say it, but there's a lot of Christians that look to me like they are not being led by the Spirit. They're being led by their flesh. They're antagonistic, they're contentious, they're divisive, they're ornery. Ornery Christians. But he says, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, but he says in, in, in verse 17, not only then are we, are we children of God, but then we're also joint heirs with Christ. Isn't that an amazing statement? God says he's given all things over to Christ, his son. All things. First Colossians. He used to have preeminence over all creation. All things are subject to him. But he says that not only that, but we become heirs. You know, the worst thing is to be adopted into the family, but not written into the will. Right? Adopted into this glorious, wealthy family, but then when it comes time to read the will, you're not even mentioned. That's, nobody wants that, right? Well, God says, I'm not that way. When I adopt you in, I put you in my will. You're heir right along with my son. That's a glorious thing. And, and we'll see later in the chapter that God... If he gives us his most precious thing, he won't withhold anything else from us. But there's this little, this little two-lettered word, if. Do you guys like ifs? Well, I'll, I'll give you this 69 Camaro if. Okay, what's coming down the line? If. Indeed, we suffer with him. So now Paul brings in this glorious act of, of we're become heirs with Christ, but attached to that is the suffering as well that goes with that. In Philippians chapter 1, it says that, that we have been granted the, the right to suffer with Christ. Isn't that a glorious thing? Thank you, Jesus. Now, in, in context, we've got to understand, Paul's writing to the church in Rome. Do you know who's running the show in Rome right now? It's a guy by the name of Nero. And you know what Nero's latest thing is? Persecuting and killing Christians by the thousands. And, and Paul's acquainted with suffering, right? You know, Paul was was beaten and left for dead, and they, they literally drug his body and tossed it out of the city walls, you know, and, and the Lord brought him back to life. He was tossed out of the ship, right, in the midst of a storm. And, and, and how many times was he just whipped and beaten and imprisoned and ran out of the cities? Paul was quite a acquainted with suffering for Christ. Now, i got to admit, I, I really can't relate to this because I don't believe I've really suffered for righteousness' sake. Oh, maybe a couple times, you know, when I was talking with some of my friends and, you know, and we brought up maybe, you know, whatever. 
And I says, no, no, the, the righteousness of God says that we sanctify life. We love life. We don't believe in that. And, you know, maybe they got a little harsh with me. Nobody's ever punched me in the face for loving Jesus. I've never experienced that. The worst I've ever... Someone called me a Jesus freak one time in England. Oh, that hurt. That, that really... So I, 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 I'm just honest. I really can't relate in a real way to what Paul says, if, we need, if needed, indeed, we suffer with him. Um, but I know that Peter wrote about it quite a bit in 1 Peter. He, he talks about the glorious uh, gift that we've been given that we can suffer alongside Christ. We, it's a gift, and, and we should rejoice in it, right? Rejoice in suffering for Christ's sake, for righteousness' sake. I don't think Americans, we don't really suffer a great deal. But I think the time is coming. I see it more and more. We're swinging that way to where I, I believe there will come a day that uh, America will start persecuting people for, for standing with Christ and, and, and for righteousness, God's righteousness. There will come a time. But he says that uh, if we do that, then, then we may also be glorified together with him. And then he goes on. So verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul says, I'm going to take all of that suffering that I've had and I'm going to put it up against the glory that I know that is coming. And it doesn't even begin to compare to it. And the interesting thing I find in this is the word in. It's not to. The glory that will be revealed in you. Oh, not to you. It's not that you're going to see glory revealed to you that you might witness it. No, it's in you. You are going to experience it. The glory that the Lord desires to reveal in you resides within you right now. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? Does it make you all bubbly? To realize that there's this glory inside of you that is one day going to be revealed to the entire world? You don't seem too excited. Yeah, yeah. Mine's going to go. Pss, pss. It's just a little spark. Pss, pss, pss. No, 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 no. This is, you see, because when Christ comes in his glory and he takes his church and we get those, those new bodies, those glorified bodies, you know, who remembers the E.T. show? You remember when he started glowing? You know, whenever, you know, That's us. It's this glory that's going to come out of us. You know why? Because it's the Spirit of God dwelling in you. It's going to be amazing, folks. I, I don't, there's not even words to describe the glory that's going to be revealed in us. It's an amazing thing. For he goes on, he says, now, verse 19 through 22, he says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Do you know that all creation out there is waiting for this revealing in you? The trees are like, I can hardly wait to see the sons of men. And he says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption or decay. It says, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. You know, in the garden, when Adam disobeyed God, right? He sinned against God. That sin not only affected him, 
but it, it affected creation as well. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, it says that God cursed the earth because of Adam's sin. I think that's pretty harsh. And so because of that now, creation, all this world that we live on, it suffers a sense of futility and of bondage to corruption. That's a hard thing. And I, and I wonder, what, what bondage, corruption, decay. And, and it kind of makes me wonder, God, did, was your creation meant that not a tree would die? Not a flower would wither? Would, uh, but I, I, I don't know. He doesn't say. But I know that he says his creation was subjected to this it was put into bondage as well, the bondage of corruption. But the cool thing about it is it's waiting to be redeemed as well, to be restored to its original, that the curse would be lifted off of it. It's the same as us, right? We desire that that curse would be lifted off of us. That's why God gave us Jesus. And so it says it... <laughs> It groans and labors with pains, waiting, waiting patiently to this day. And not only that, verse 23, it says, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. I believe the first fruits of the Spirit is Jesus. Jesus was the firstborn over uh, all creation. He's the, the, the first fruit of the resurrection of life. And so it says, we too have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have Jesus in us. So even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So here, we too. Do, do you ever groan? As, as we're just waiting we're all hanging sheetrock out there the other day, and all we could talk about is how our bodies are falling apart. I can't lift it. Oh, man, this is just was so sore. I, I picked up the garbage the other day, and oh, it just about undid me. My back. Oh, gosh, have you ever? We sat around here eating Subway sandwiches, just, and I'm just laughing to myself. Yes, we're suffering. We're under the bondage of corruption as well. Decaying. Our bodies are just decaying around us. And so we groan under this because we know that there's something more glorious that's coming. And we can hardly wait, right? And so each day, sometimes it gets really hard to wait. Blaine's shaking. He's, he agrees with me. You know, we, there's this groaning. Creation's groaning, waiting for this. Mankind, we're groaning, waiting for this. And, and waiting, eagerly waiting for this adoption of redemption that we're, that's coming. It says, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. That's a description of faith, right? Faith is believing in something that's not seen. You can't grab hold of it. You can't hold of it. You can't. But we eagerly do it with <coughs> perseverance. Perseverance. Steadfastness. Not giving up. Hanging on. Continuing on even in the face of not wanting to continue on. That's pers we persevere. We continue on. It's faith. He says, but uh, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Okay. Spirit of God in us helps in our weaknesses. For what? What weakness are we talking about? For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Is that a weakness in you? It sure is in me. I get up every morning and it seems like there's so much to pray for, I have no idea where to even begin. It's, sometimes it's overwhelming. 
And so I don't pray at all. I'm just being honest. Sometimes it's overwhelming. I just, I just, I'm seized up. It's hard sometimes, you know. You know what? It just, there's this. You know, sometimes I just want to shut it all off. Get rid of the televisions. Don't ever look at a newspaper. Someone starts talking. I just, ah, no, 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 no. And I just want to live in my own little world. And, and, and it, where everything's nice. Except for my poor wife has to put up with me. It's not so nice in her world. But, but you see, God doesn't call us to live in that world, does he? No. No, God says get involved. How are you going to be a light if you're hiding under a bushel? You're to be a city on a hill shining your light. You're to let everybody see your good works that they might glorify your Father in heaven. So we're not called to isolate ourselves from this world, but we're actually called to be part of it. We have to walk in it. But praise be to God that he gave us the Spirit that he might help us in our weaknesses. And he says, for, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Praise God. The Spirit of God takes over when I am at my weakest and I don't know which way to go. The Spirit of God takes over. And it says it does it with what? Groanings. There's a lot of groaning going on here. Creation's groaning. I'm groaning the Spirit of God that dwells within me is groaning, making intercession for me with, with words that can't be uttered, groanings which cannot be uttered. It's beyond us. You know, it talks about that bowl of, of incense in, in the throne room of God. And you know what that incense is, that sweet aroma that God is smelling? It's our prayers. It's that, that bowl is continually filled with our prayers, and it's a sweet incense to God. He smells that, and it's, I'm like, gosh, sometimes I think my prayers just stink, Lord. They have no power or depth to them. Sometimes they, they feel very superficial when I see the, the gravity and the weight of sin in the world. It just, and, and they devastate, you know, those, all those people in, it's just like one after another. You know, a couple years ago, it was Paradise, California. And we just pray for Paradise, and the people are losing their homes, and it's just tragic what's going on. And now it's Australia, and then there's a tsunami, and Puerto Rico, and Venezuela. And I just, you know, oh my gosh, Lord, when's it going to end? It just, it just, it breaks me, it hurts me. My wife says, you take it too personal. You're too deep a thinker. She said, you think too deep about this. Yeah, she did say that this morning. Yes, yes, on the way to. But you see, that's it's just how it is because the Spirit of God lives within me and, and it breaks our heart to see all this in, in this world. And, and so thank God he's given us the Spirit that can kind of step in when we're weak. In verse 27, it says, now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And who is it who searches our hearts? It's God. God talks about this. He searches the hearts of men. And he knows what the, what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that's Christ, right? Jesus makes intercession for us. According to God's will. So I kind of dwelt upon that this, this week too. You make intercession for me, but only according to God's will. Oh, that kind of changes things a bit. He doesn't make intercession for me on behalf of all things, but only those things that are according to God's will. And all of a sudden, the little squirrel cage goes off, right? And I'm thinking all these different, I go down all these different avenues. What, well, what was what, what, he for my sanctification? 
He intercedes on my behalf for our salvation, for our um, consecration, the things that God desires for your life. Jesus is interceding on your behalf for those things. You know, to know the will of God in your life, right? Do we struggle with this? Lord, what's, what's, your, what's your will in my life? And, you know, I, I started a list in the back of my Bible here. Um, got a little section called The Will of God. And every time I come across it, uh, something that's according to God's will, I, well, I've kind of run out of room. But I need to start a new list. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, that I would be sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, that I would give thanks in everything. 1 Corinthians, that I would receive the gifts of the Spirit. Um, that everyone, John 6, that everyone that believes in Jesus will have everlasting life. That's the will of God for us. Matthew 18, that no children would perish. That's the will of God for us, that no children would perish. Uh, to bring us forth by His Word, that's the will of God. To do good and to share with others, that's the will of God for my life. You see, Jesus is up there going, Lord, I pray that you would help Will to do good and to share with others. Lord, I, I wish that you would help Will to teach the children that they might not perish. Lord, I, I, I pray that I intercede on Will's behalf that, that he would give thanks for something <laughs> once in a while. Do you, see, do you see how it works? It's not that, that Will would get that new car or that Will would avoid that nasty circumstance or business with those other people. No, 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 no. He doesn't intercede on those, but it's things according to God's will. And there's a, a plethora of them. And I love it because all the things that he's interceding on, on my behalf for, all have to do with my spirit. They all have to do with my walk with God. They all have to do with my relationship with God and with people. It's for my good that he does this. And we see in the very next verse, it says, verse 28, and we all got this. This is, this is one of those memory verses we all grab a hold of. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes. All things work together for good for everybody. Ah, to those who love God. Ah, oh, but the world doesn't like, no wonder they hate us. That's a pretty harsh thing to say. I, I didn't write it. It's, it the amazing thing is, is God is beyond time. We need to understand that. Maybe they don't love God now, but they may in the future. We know that all things work together for good. All things work together. Not just the singular moment. Lord, I'm just having struggles in this moment. Would you use that for my good? God says, yeah, but I'm going to use it with other things as well, that all things might work together for your good. Think about it. It's not just the things that's going in my, on in my life that God's going to use for my good, but it's the things that are going on in Jackie's life and in Greg's life and in Kim's life and, and, and in Sandy's life. He's going to use all those things together for my good, and for yours too. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. He works all things together. Wow. That's maybe even things from my past life before Jesus, right? Yeah. He uses things from even then, before my... B.C. days, before Jesus, it, it, he uses them together for my good.
God is so good. He is so good. You know, sometimes I just don't think that we realize the depth of it all. Because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. It is divine. It is, we'll see here, it was, it was preordained for you. He knew you and he had a plan for your life. And Jeremiah says, you know, before I was formed in the womb, Lord, you had a purpose for my life. I find that amazing. You know that, right? You have a purpose in this life. So many people walk around, they say, I don't have a purpose. I have no purpose in the church. Well, let me tell you, I got a list for you. I can plug you right in. There's a purpose for your life. Too many of our kids are walking around thinking they have no purpose in this world, in this life. Right? And they they fall to so many wicked things trying to placate that feeling that's inside them. I had a lady call me the other day. Her son's in prison. And she says, would you tell him that he is holy unto God? Would you remind him that he's holy to God? Would you, would you please, when you see young people, would you remind them that they're holy to God? God created you. He has a purpose for your life. And you're holy. You're precious to him. He has a purpose for you. He said it there. For those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. You know, and and maybe it's not to be a missionary or a pastor or evangelical preacher, whatever. Maybe it's just that your purpose in life is just to tell people that Jesus loves them. I don't know. Maybe it is to go to Morocco. We'll help you. We'll get you going. You see, but how do we know God's purpose if we don't read his word? If we don't pray, if we don't listen, if we don't follow, if we don't allow ourselves to be led by the spirit of God that dwells within us, how will we ever begin to know the purpose that God has for your life? God has given you specific gifts. I would say a good place to start is use those gifts for God. Use those gifts for God. We had a purpose for Greg yesterday. He's holding sheetrock to a ceiling. That we might build this building that, that maybe youth could come in there, that they could learn about the Lord and that they would not perish. We have definite use for those skills, those talents. There's a purpose in, for your life. Maybe it sounds mundane. Maybe it doesn't sound real spiritual. I, so what? It's who you are. That's who God created you to be. We are called according to his purpose. Not ours, but his. And all things work together for our good, to those who love God. In 29, through, he says, For whom we, he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We could go into the whole Calvinism thing right here. I could just sit on this and and I could preach Calvinism. Uh, I, I believe in the free will of man. But I also believe in the divine supremacy and the omniscience of God. God knew everyone that would ever be born every, before they were created. He knew you. I don't have a problem with that. He knew you. And he predestined you to what? says right there, to be conformed 
into the image of His Son. God knew you and predestined you before you were born to be conformed to the image of His perfect and glorious Son. Well, there's a pretty good purpose in life. To look more like Jesus. To act more like Jesus. To talk more like Jesus. To be more graceful like Jesus. To be more merciful like Jesus. Conform to the image of Christ. That's the purpose for your life to begin with. I think it's awesome. I don't have to figure it out. God just spells it out for me. And he says, not only did he predestine me, but he, he also called me. You know, Jesus walked through this life on this earth. And what did he do? He called for people, come and follow me. It was a constant calling. Everybody is called to come and follow Jesus. Every person that's ever lived and walked this earth was called to follow Christ in one way or another. Whether creation was speaking it to them or a missionary or God's word or God's spirit was calling them to come follow Jesus. It's an amazing thing that's going on in the world of, of Islam today because God's spirit is speaking to people and calling them to come and follow Jesus. And they've never seen a Bible in their entire life. And they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life. But the Spirit of God is speaking to them through dreams and visions. The book of Joel. I've met them. I've talked to them. They've described to me their dreams. And it's led them to Christ. You see, God loves them so much that He's not going to let them go without knocking on the door of their hearts, speaking to them about His glorious Son. He just isn't going to do it. He loves us too much. He's called us. He's justified us. And He wants to glorify us. Wow. Wow. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? Okay, Paul, you tell me, what, what am I to say to that? Well, if God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> and we, we got this one down too, right? If God is for us, who can be against us? You know, in the first five chapters of, of, of the book of Romans, Paul just talked about how unrighteous we were. Even in our our morality and our ethics and our religion and you know, whatever it may be, we just found no righteousness with God. But then there's this thing about coming to Jesus and, and we're born again and we find our righteousness with Jesus and now all of a sudden God is for us. When it seemed like He was against me before and I, and I was a child of wrath, right? And it says, I had enmity with God. I was at war with God. But it says, once I came to Jesus, I found peace with God. And so I'm now no, no longer at war with God. And God is for me. I find that just, wow. God changed his mind that easily? Just simply by believing in Jesus, now all of a sudden God is for me? Yes. Yes. He is for you. But, but I still fail. God is for you. But I just, I'm, I'm such a disappointment all the time. I just disappoint everybody around me. I disappoint God. God is for you. I, I just don't seem to be growing. My spiritual walk with God just seems stale. And, and it seems like I, I haven't grown in years. God is for you. I just don't, I, I just can't get over my past. I just can't seem to move forward. God is for you. I keep sinning. I just can't seem to repent of this sin and move forward in my life either. God is for you. He's not against you in any of this. He's for you. 
he wants to see you overcome all of that stuff. Sometimes I just, I make it more about me, and it's not. It's about him, and allowing him to move and, and, and work in my life, allowing the Spirit of God to lead me. You know, sometimes I just feel so weak, Lord. I just feel so weak. I feel so anemic. God is for me. He wants to see me through all of that stuff. He wants to, he doesn't want to leave me. He's for me. We need to hold on to that. When you're struggling with, through things out there and you just think that you're alone and, and that there's just no way to get through this, God is for you. He's on the sideline. He's cheering you on. It's fourth down and 15 to go, and God says, you can do it. Football's coming, right? Come on. Super Bowl next week. God is for you. You can do it. Throw it out there. Give a Hail Mary pass. Try it. Step out into the waters. God is for you. Don't let your past or your weaknesses or, or whatever you think is holding you up, don't allow that to stagnate the work of God in your life. He's for us. And so who can be against us? And, and you say, well, what proof do I have that God is really for me? What proof do I have? Show me something. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God proved that he was for you when he gave up his only begotten son. He gave him up for you and for me. How much more, what more could you ask for? He gave his most precious. He gave of himself. And, and so 33 he says, so who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So who is he that condemns? Well, the Bible says that Jesus will one day come and judge the world. Right? So Jesus is the one who will come and condemn all unrighteousness, all wickedness, all sinfulness in this world. But here's the thing. If you are His, and you belong to Him, and He's making intercession on your behalf, how can He condemn you? He can't. He's your advocate. He's your lawyer. We talked about this last week, right? The worst thing you want to do is, is hire a lawyer that goes up and then opening statement says, oh yeah, he's guilty as sin. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I know the whole story. Let me tell you about it. He did this, he did this, he did this, and he just condemns you right out of the gate. Jesus doesn't do that. He makes intercession. He sits next to the judge and goes, hey, hey, judge, we don't need to look at any of that. You just look at me because he, she belongs to me. They're mine. They're being conformed into my image. So when you see them, you see me. He makes intercession for us. He stands in the gap for us. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate you from the love of God. When you accepted Jesus as your Savior, when you confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, when you confessed that Jesus came in the flesh and dwelt among men and died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave, 
walked the face of this earth for 40 more days, and then ascended to the Father, and sits at the right hand of the Father, even and speaks on my behalf. That's the love of God in your life. There is nobody or anything that can separate you from that. He, he, shall tribulation separate you from the love of God? No. Shall distresses, so distressed today, Lord, and feel so unloved. You're wrong. Persecutions, no. Famine, starving to death. God still loves you. Nakedness, I ain't got no clothes. Got nothing to wear today. God still loves you. Peril or sword, that's talking about dying. No, that will not separate you from the love of God. None of this stuff. And Paul writes, he says, as it is written, he goes to Psalms 44, he says, For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Yes, because God uses all things to work together for our good. Even sending his son to die on a cross is a thing that God used to work together for my good. That's what we're talking about here. Something that happened 2,000 years ago, plus, God is still using for my good. Because God does not want to see me perish. That's the love of God. And he says, yes, in all these things, I'm more than conquerors through him who loved us. I can conquer tribulations, distresses, persecutions, and all of this other stuff. I can conquer that. I can overcome that in him, in Christ. If we'll just grab a hold of it. If we'll just walk by faith, if we'll just have a little strength to, to, to hold on to the Spirit of God and allow it to, to move, be, persevere, hold on. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We should be jumping up and down right now. <laughs> At least get a, can I get a hallelujah? Get yeah. an amen, brother. Yeah. Woo! There is nothing in this world that can separate me from the love of God. It is with me in the morning and at night. It is with me when I'm watching the news. Yeah, it is with me when I'm dealing with my cantankerous boss. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's a promise of God. Even when I'm at my worst sinful moment in life, I am not separated from the love of God. Because, you see, God's love is greater than that. God's grace is greater than that. It's greater than all of this other stuff. We need to remember that as we walk through this life. Well, I got depressed. And when I'm feeling depressed, I don't feel like God loves me. Who cares what you feel? The truth is God's word states it, and his word is yes and amen. God's promises stand forever. That's why we're here today, 2,000 and some odd years later, even after Nero killed all those Christians and half the world ran, the love of God still remained and still is being poured out on the hearts of men. 
because he loves us and he does not want to see us perish. The love of God is greater than all of that. It's greater than your physical ailments. It's greater than your mental problems. It's greater than your financial problems. or your. It's greater than all that. That's the point that Paul's trying to make with us. It's greater than our past sins, our present sins, or our future sins. It's greater than that. There is nothing in heaven or below that can separate us from the love of God. And you know what? There's nothing else in you that can do that either. Short of simply denying him. Well, there's one thing. <laughs> I'd say Paul didn't mention that, but I think that should be mentioned. If you deny the Holy Spirit into your life to begin with, how can God work all things for your good? You can't. You're on your own. You've set yourself up. You said, I'll, I'll do it myself. I don't need you, God. I don't need your love. I don't need it. First John 5, 4. Verse 5, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I, actually, I love the book, book of 1 John. I just love it. It's one of my favorite books. Short book, five or six chapters, I think. And, and he says in 1 John, verses 5, 4 and 5, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory uh, that we have that overcomes the world. This is the victory that we have that overcomes the world, our faith. Your faith is what helps you to overcome the world. For who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You see, we're more than conquerors. We're overcomers. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's pretty simple. And believe it or not, It works. It works. In my worst times, when I think I just can't do this anymore, I remember that I've been given eternal life in Christ Jesus by simply believing in Him. And then the Spirit of God does something in my heart, gives me a little peace, and the next thing you know, I'm moving forward again. To God's glory. To God's glory. Amen. So the worship team come up. Uh, How about you guys? Can you grab a hold of that? Can you say today that I am an overcomer of this world? I am more than a conqueror. I know that God loves me. Because that's... that's that's it, right? That's what Paul's telling us today. God loves us and that we have life, victorious life. Forgive us when we don't act like it, when we don't walk in it, when we're a bunch of Eeyores, <laughs> right? We're just a bunch of Eeyores. I know I've been saved. <laughs> we, need, we, we need to be poos. <laughs> yeah, Winnie, he's always happy, Tigger. right? Tigger. 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 Tigger's, Tigger. Well, I don't know about Tigger's. Tigger. <laughs> we have such a promise in God. I, I, he loves us so desperately. I, I wish I had words to describe the depth of God's love for us. I really do. We're going to do center. Would you like to stand with me?
the place we fix our eyes be the center of our lives oh and Christ be the center of our lives be the place we fix our eyes be the center So, Father, just pray, Lord, today as we walk out of here that uh, we would just hold on to your promise, God, that nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, I pray that we would be uh, led by the Spirit each and every day of our lives, God, that we would give place to you, that your Spirit would move in our hearts, and Lord, change us, transform us, conform us into the image of your glorious Son, Lord. You've predestined us for that very purpose 
And so, God, we know that whatever you have purposed in our lives, Lord, you will accomplish. And so, God, we trust in that, and we look for that in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.